Good morning. We're going to be in uh, Proverbs chapter 1 this morning. Actually, we're going to be in Proverbs 1 through 3 this morning. Do you believe me? I actually did most of my study for service. We'll see if I can, if I can duplicate that. Um, I, w- I wanted to, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, by the way, I was um, over in um, Kent, Washington, doing a uh, study for the Calvary over there um, last Sunday. So how, how'd Matt do? Yeah. Don't you like, I like it that, that my guys know how to teach. I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, um, had a good time over there, um, but uh, two weeks ago, we went through and we talked about being a fool. And uh, remember that? I pity the fool. I, just, I love it. I'm going to use that again this morning. So we're going to be in Proverbs. And I just want to talk about uh, kind of on a positive note what it, what it means to be wise and uh, specifically um, what the book of Proverbs uh, speaks about with that. And, you know, school's coming up. Actually, uh, a lot of you have already started school. How many of you are in school right now? Raise your hands. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> And I just titled it Being Schooled. You guys know what being schooled is, right? So being schooled, this is from the Urban Dictionary. Losing a contest, game or bat- game battle or argument in a humiliating fashion while the other person shows you how it's done. They remain as cool as a cucumber as if it didn't even require effort on their part. So that's what being schooled is. And basically I wanted to title it, uh, title um, the study Being Schooled because if you don't get schooled by God in the sense of um, God showing you what's up, then you're gonna get schooled by the world and, and uh, you're gonna end up in a, in a position that's not very good. With that, let's, uh, let's go through and read it and uh, then we'll pray. Why don't you guys all stand? Starting in verse one, Proverbs chapter one. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood, Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol or the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path for their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is uh, spread in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who's greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. Let's stop right there. Let's pray. Jesus, um, God, you're just such a blessing to us. You're you're so good to us. And um, Lord, as we're going through your word this morning, we pray that, uh, again, that you would be speaking to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you made a promise that wherever we're gathered together, that you're walking up and down in the midst. And Lord, we just expect to hear from you. So God, uh, we just pray that you bless the study of your word and um, help us to have hearts that can receive it. And we ask that you do this all in Jesus' name, amen. And you can have a seat. Um, You know, speaking about being schooled, this is a good illustration of that. I had a friend once um, who uh, grew up with a ping pong table. He's one of those guys who just played ping pong all the the time. He's like Forrest Gump, uh, if you guys remember that movie. In any case, he, um, he played ping pong all the time. And so we're off at a family retreat. And uh, so I decide, you know, he's, he's wiping guys out playing ping pong. I never played ping pong, hardly ever. But I decided to, to go after him and stuff. And so we played ping pong. Well, the first game that we played, he, he beat me like some ridiculous score. It was like 21 to 3. It was, it was like just over the top. And you know, hardly any effort and stuff. And I'm really competitive. And so I'm going to try real hard. And so I go another game. And so this time I, I probably got up to eight points, 21 to eight, something like that. And then I'm like, I'm not quitting uh, because, you know, this, you know, he's, he, he's kind of getting a little cocky and, and all, all that kind of stuff, prideful. You know, God, I knew God was going to curse him. <laughs> you know? And so 
um, I go, I want to play another game. And so we played another game. And this time, I'm, I'm hot. And I'm, I'm scoring on him and stuff like that. I get it up to 18 points, 18 or 19 points, something like that. He still beat me, 21, 18, 21, 19, somewhere in there. And uh, at the end of it, I'm like, yeah! <laughs> See the improvement there? And he's just sitting there smiling at me. And, and then, uh, then he looks at me and he goes, Steve, I was playing left-handed. <laughs> that is what being schooled is. And speaking of school, I have a bunch of school jokes, so here's my first one. Early one morning, a mother went, to, went in to wake up her son. Wake up, son, it's time to go to school. But why, mom? I don't want to go. Give me two reasons why you don't want to go. Well, the kids hate me for one, and the teachers hate me too. Oh, that's no reason not to go to school. Come on now and get ready. Give me two reasons why I should go to school. Well, for one, you're 52 years old. And for another, you're the principal. <laughs> you know, we all got to go to school. And, you know, as you go through and you look at what the book of Proverbs says, has to say about the fool, and we already kind of dealt with that, not um, decisively by any means. There's a lot of verses in the book of Proverbs about a fool. But we already uh, pretty much covered that. And I just wanted to go through and, and look at what the Bible has to say in Proverbs about how to become wise. These uh, Proverbs that we're going through were written by Solomon to his son. So the first nine chapters are specifically Solomon talking to his kid about how life is supposed to go and the things that um, he's supposed to be watching out for. You remember Solomon was the son of David, and when he became king, God told him, I will give you whatever you want. Pray and ask me, and I'll give you whatever you want. And, you know, a lot of people, if they ever had that happen, you know, it, it'd be like, you know, Aladdin, the genie or something. They'd just be wanting wealth and power and fame and, and all of that kind of stuff. And what Solomon asked was for wisdom to rule, his, rule God's people. And God said, because you didn't ask me for wealth and fame, I'm going to give you those both too. Uh, but God gave him wisdom. And this is Solomon in his wisdom. And so you are about to benefit from uh, some of the things that um, actually at the time of Solomon, the Bible says he was the wisest man on the planet. In fact, people um, came to visit him just to hear from him. Long journeys came to visit Solomon just to hear from this guy because of the wisdom that God had given him. <clears throat> and so Solomon imparts that to us. He gives us wisdom. Anytime you're in school, you start off with vocab, right? You know, vocabulary. So there's a couple words in here. Um, let's go through and start reading. In verse two, it says, to know wisdom and instruction. Um, wisdom, let's start, just start with that. Wisdom is not knowledge. Um, knowledge is just knowing stuff. And so have you ever known somebody that was book smart and, and street stupid? Yeah, that's somebody who has knowledge and has no wisdom. Um, I, uh, one of the guys came up to me um, after first service, and he said, you should use this illustration. Um, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. So wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. So knowledge is knowing stuff. Wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive or understand the words of understanding to receive the instruction of justice. Justice is just a word that means righteousness. It's the idea of, of uh, the right thing. Um, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment is doing the right thing as a judge in the sense of you know what the right thing is and when you're looking at people, you're able to judge them rightly. And then equity, it says, and equity is just being fair. So I need to be somebody who knows what's right I need to be somebody who knows how to apply the right to the people who are around me, and I need to be somebody who's absolutely fair. That's what's being spoken in, about in that passage. To the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear an increase, or excuse me, I, I missed verse four. To give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase, increase learning. Here's some more vocab for you. Prudence is cleverness or shrewdness. It's, um, Jesus in the New Testament said that we need to be people who are wise as serpents but harmless as doves. 
And it's the idea of, of being somebody who knows, who, who knows how people work, who knows how things work, who's, somebody who's shrewd, basically. I got a couple of jokes that illustrate shrewdness. A school teacher injured his back and had to wear a plaster cast around the upper part of his body. It fit under his shirt and was not noticeable at all. And on the first day of the term, he, still with a cast under his shirt, he found himself assigned to the toughest students in school. Walking confidently into the rowdy classroom, he opened the window as wide as possible and then busied himself with desk work. When a strong breeze made his tie flap, he took the desk stapler and stapled the tie to his chest. He had no trouble with discipline from that, from that time on. Here's another one. A wise old gentleman retired and purchased a modest home near a junior high school. He spent the first few weeks of his retirement in peace and contentment. Then a new school year began. The very next afternoon, three young boys full of youthful after-school enthusiasm came down his street beating merrily on every trash can they encountered. The crashing percussion continued day after day until finally the wise old man decided it was time to take some action. The next afternoon, he walked out to meet the young percussionists as they banged their way down the street. Stopping them, he said, you kids are a lot of fun. I like to see you express your exuberance like that. I used to do the same thing when I was your age. Will you do me a favor? I'll give you each a dollar if you'll promise to come around every day and do your thing. The kids were elated and continued to do a bang-up job on the trash cans. A few days later, the wily retiree approached them again as they drummed their way down the street. Look, he said, I, have, I haven't received my social security check yet, so I'm not going to be able to give you more than 25 cents. Will that be okay? A lousy quarter, the drum leader exclaimed. If you think we're going to waste our time beating these cans around for a quarter, you're nuts. No way, mister, we quit. <laughs> and the old man enjoyed peace and serenity for the rest of his days. <laughs> that's prudence. That's, that's being somebody who is clever or somebody who's shrewd. By the way, the Bible says in the book of Psalms that when people are shrewd with God, he's shrewd with them. There are people who think they're being clever with God and God turns the cleverness around on them. You need to be clever in the biblical way. You need to be clever in the right way. The word simple there is a word that means naive or inexperienced. And one of the things that um, you need to know when you're young is that you are naive and you are inexperienced. And it's something that um, everybody's got to figure out. And if you don't figure, out, figure it out early, you're going to get schooled. And somebody's going to cream you. Um, the word discretion, it says to the young man, knowledge and discretion. That word discretion means wise planning or discernment. Um, when, I, when I was young, um, this, is, this is one of those things that, that I kind of, figured out when I was, I was right about 16, maybe a little bit older, 16, 17 years old. And I had some things going on in my family. And you know, you know some of it, I, I've never told everybody everything, but I, I had some things going on in my family and I would go and talk to my friends about it. My friends were 16 and 17. And I'd go and talk to them about it. And you know what? They were stupid. They would tell me dumb things. And I would listen to them. And a lot of times the dumb things that they told me were things that I actually wanted to hear things that I actually wanted to do, things that, I, that I, I felt like I had the right to do, and things that I knew if I did, I was just going to make the problems bigger, and it was not, not only going to bleed out on me, it was going to bleed out on my little sisters, and it was going to bleed out on my brother too. And so I'd listen to them, and I, you know, I started figuring out, these people are dumb. It's like, I'm sitting here 16 years old, I'm dumb, and they're dumber. So dumb and dumber. You know, and, and I'm sitting here listening to these guys and I figured out that I, what I needed was somebody who had some more experience. I started talking to coaches at that point and I started mentioning things to teachers at that point. I never had big, long conversations with these people, but when I did talk to them, they gave me nuggets of wisdom that, that pointed me in the right, right direction. I frankly didn't want anybody to know what was going on in my home. And so I, I tried to find somebody that I could look up to, somebody that had some kind of wisdom. I wasn't a Christian at the time, um, not until after I was 16. Um, later on, um, after I was 16 and stuff. Uh, but um, those, are, those are some of the things that I figured out. I knew I was naive. I, I knew that I was inexperienced. And so what I needed to do was find somebody who had more experience than me, okay? The, it, the passage goes on here and it talks about um, a wise man 
will hear, well, I'm, I'm kind of getting in the middle of the verse, to receive the instruction of wisdom, verse three, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel, to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. And so if you want to be wise, one of, the, one of the things that the Bible says here, verse 5, is that you need to be somebody who will listen up. That word hear in the passage is the idea of hear and understand and receive it. That, that's what needs to happen. And um, one of the things that you have to watch out for um, as a Christian man, and again, this is, this is talking about men, um, specifically because Solomon's talking to his son. Obviously, it applies to women too. But I need, I need to be somebody who's basically coachable. And that's why I put that up on the screen. Coachable. You need to, need to be somebody who will actually listen to somebody and actually take advice from them. Way too often, and again, I'm talking to the men, way too often men are faking their way through mo much of their life. Much of everything that goes on, they just fake it. You don't, you don't know what's going on in a certain subject and you just pretend like you do. You know, um, it's September and so the Christmas decorations are coming out at the end of the month, right? Uh, out in the malls and all, all that stuff. And so Christmas is coming up. Um, how many of you are guys that use the directions when you put things together? Raise your hands. You are few and far between. How many of you are guys who don't use the directions and just try to do it, right? How many of you are successful when you're doing it that way? And you never have to pick up the directions. You are lying, <laughs> liar. Because I am just like that. I have, to, I have to force myself to pick the, the directions up. And it's because I've gone through so many Christmases where I was putting something together and I thought I had it all and I got into the middle of it and I realized if I just paid attention to the directions, I wouldn't have to be tearing parts apart to get to the one little screw that I need to have, you know, you know what I mean? You get to the end of the project and there's extra parts, spare parts, and you go put them in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> Hope your kid doesn't die on the bike or whatever. You know, you, you need to be somebody who actually understands that you might need to know something and you might get information from actually someone else. And so it goes on in this passage and talks about picking teachers. A wise man, again, verse five, will hear and increase learning and a man of counsel will attain, literally means acquire wise counsel. Look for guys, look for women who know more than you. That's the, that's the next thing. You pick your teachers wisely. And like I said before, when I was a kid, there were times when I was picking teachers and I wasn't picking them wisely. I don't want to pick somebody to teach me who is a doofus just like me, who has no information on the whole issue. I don't want to pick somebody who is going to if, affirm my idiotic tendencies. You know, there are times when, have you ever done something that you just looked at after the fact and went, you are an idiot. <laughs> have you ever done that? Any, anybody? Am I the only guy? Yeah, you are an idiot. So you don't want to go out and look for people who will agree with your stupid. You want to look for somebody who actually has it together on some level or another. And so you need to t pick your teachers wisely. Be coachable, pick your teachers wisely. I like that whole thing with coachable though, um, the most because... Um, you know, I've been a coach, and so I coached my son. You know, I've, I've coached a number of things over the years, but I coached my son in football, and he was one of the greatest kids to coach. Um, I had a, uh, I, I didn't, it wasn't just him. I, I, I coached, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you call that, the little kids? Football. Great kids. I coached great kids. And so it was really a fun time because you had these kids who knew nothing, and I was a line coach and a linebacker coach, and I was te teaching the kids how to hit and all this kind of stuff. We just had a whole bunch of fun because I loved to hit when I was a kid and, uh, you know, obviously older and stuff like that. But one of the things about my son, and I'm going to brag about him, sorry, Nate, but one of, the, one of the things about the guy is that he would do exactly what I said. I took, I, I'd send him into a game, and he'd be having problems. And there were a couple of times that he was, he was going up against kids that were just huge. Remember this one time he's playing and, and he weighed about 130 pounds. The kid that was up against him had to be 200 pounds in grid kids. It was ridiculous. Kids coming out on the, on the field. And I'm like, Jesus, no, 
please, God, no. Not in front of my son, please, Lord. You know, and guess where he lines up? Yeah, right in front of my son. And so, uh, my son. He's not my sin. Sometimes he's in sin. No, he's not. He's a great guy. Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, he, he comes out and he's all flustered and stuff. And I just, you know, being a line coach is pretty easy because they're just basics. And so what you do is you get off the ball first. That's the idea when the ball snapped, you're the first one moving. That's the first rule. Second rule is you get lower than the other guy. And third rule, and there's other rules, but third one is pop him as hard as you can every single play and you never let up. So off the ball first and you're lower than him and you're popping him as hard as you can. And that's what I told him. He went out and I, I told him, you know what, Nate, the kid's fat and he's going to get tired. You do this to him, you're going to have him all game long. And that's exactly what he did. And he just went out and tooled the guy. And all the way up through, you know, uh, when he was in high school, same kind of thing. Well, the, one of the cool things about him was that he was coachable. You have to hear and increase learning. And you have to have a wise teacher. So those are things that, that you need to be paying attention to. Here's a wise teacher. Look at verse 7. God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And all the way through the first nine chapters of Proverbs, you have this, um, and specifically through the passages that we're going to talk about, you have this pattern. Listen to your mom and dad. Listen to the Lord. Mom and dad are telling you, go listen to the Lord. And so basically the only two um, People in the passages that impart wisdom are the mother and the father of the kid in the passage and the Lord. And the mother and the father are always pointing them to the Lord. Not to a bunch of books, not to a bunch of psychology books, not to a bunch of sociology books, not to some teacher somewhere, not to a psychologist, not to a pastor, not to the youth leader, to the Lord. And it's something that, again, you need to keep in mind. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You want real knowledge, you have to know that the Lord's there first. And one of the, one of the you know, I'm, I'm a science guy. I love science. I, I read technical articles all the time. And one of the things about the times that we're living in is science is getting tweaked more and more. They're going off in wrong directions more and more, and they're refusing to stop and backtrack and get on the right track. I'll give you an example of that. Well, let me, let me give you the first example first. Did you know that all modern science started with Christians? They were all Christians. And what they literally thought, whether you were talking about astrophysics or whether, whether you were talking about chemistry or whether you were talking about any other the, uh, of the solid sciences, what they literally thought was that there was a God who had created everything, that he was rational, and so we could think his thoughts after him. In fact, that's the phrase that they used all the time. We're just thinking God's thoughts after him. And that's how they went after it. You don't have the... Um, the uh, type of scientific revolution that we had in modern, um, actually, well, it would be modern, but modern Christian societies, biblically-based societies, that you, you don't have the same kind of revolution in the sciences um, in anywhere else in the world. For example, over in India. In India, one of the basic tenets is that everything that you see is not real. It's all a dream. And so if it's all a dream, it's just something that's been made up in my head. If it's all something that's been made up in my head, why would I ever go and try to discover why things work? And they didn't in India, for example. And you have the same thing in, in other cultures. And I'm not saying that Indians are dumb. I'm talking about India, you know what I mean. I'm not saying that Indians are dumb because they're some of the smartest people on the planet. But if they just went by their philosophies, they wouldn't be looking into anything. And it's because of Western philosophy, which came from the Bible, that you have this stuff going on. You get up to modern times, and what we have is a whole um, structure of scientists that have basically abandoned God and decided that there is no God. And so they get themselves in all kinds of silly positions. So here's a silly position. Um, back in the 90s, um, there was a lady who was doing um, excavation. She was a paleontologist. She was excavating over in Montana 
um, at, a, at a certain site. She dug up a dinosaur bone, and lo and behold, it was actually a bone. It wasn't a, um, a fossil. It wasn't fossilized. It wasn't completely fossilized. It was a bone. They ended up cutting the bone open, and there was goo on the inside. And so now we have a bone from a dinosaur that's actually bone, and it has goo on the inside. When they examined the goo, they found out that the goo had proteins in it. And not only did the goo have proteins in it, the goo, the goo had red blood cells in it. And not only did it have red blood cells, it had uh, blood vessels in it. It's a 67 million year old bone that's actually bone with blood vessels, blood cells, and proteins. And that doesn't happen. That can't happen. It's not possible that that can happen, okay? And so what happened with that was there was a big uproar about um, her methods and people were accusing her left and right of um, contaminating the samples and mistaking blood vessels for bacterial growth and all kinds of stuff until they were forced into the fact that it was actually blood vessels and red blood cells and it was actually proteins. And then what they did was they decided that, um, okay, well, we have some kind of miraculous event that kept this bone and all the soft stuff on the inside of it soft for 67 million years. Here's the facts. After 67 million years, there will be no bone. Here's a fact. After 67 million years, there will be no blood vessels. After 67 million years, there will be no red blood cells, there will be no proteins, there will be no goo. Here's the other thing that, that, they, um, that I found out about this site, is that the bone stank. It stunk like death. It stunk like something that was rotting. And not only did that bone stink like something was rotting, every bone in, in the site when they dig it up, stinks like something that's rotting. Guess what doesn't happen after 67 million years? Rot. There is no stink after 67 million years. And so what's the answer to that? And the answer to that is, oh, lo and behold, some miraculous event preserved these, you know, these products. Not that the bone is young, it's that the bone is still old and some miraculous event preserved all these things. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. And a scientist who does that is not going where the science leads. And that's the, that's the problem that we have. You ditch God, grab a philosophy, and you, you hold on to that philosophy no matter what the facts are. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning. It's not the end of it. It's the beginning of it. And if you don't have a real desire to please God, if you don't have an understanding that he's there and he's somebody that you, you're accountable to, you're going to go off in all kinds of wongo places and never be able to figure out why you were messed up. At the end of, of this section in Proverbs, he says to his son, the fear of the Lord is not only the beginning of knowledge, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Okay, and so the first person that we should be looking to for real wisdom is the Lord himself. Here's another, look at verse eight. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. And so, um, oops, I messed up. Um, another one that you're supposed to be looking to is your dad and your mom. There are only a very few people who really know you and really care for you, and can actually give you wisdom, give you wisdom. Mom and dad are at the top of the list, and fools don't know that. Fools don't understand it. And this is what I mean by that. You know, I, I came from a non-Christian home, and so I understand that there are um, times when I don't need to be paying attention to the instruction of, uh, that comes from my father, or the instruction that comes from my mother. My father and mother lived a lifestyle that was totally anti-God. But it doesn't mean that everything that they did or everything that they said to me was absolutely wrong. They did have some experience. 
and they didn't know me on some levels or another. There's a question as to, you know, there can be questions as to whether or not um, your father and mother really care for you. I understand I've seen people in situations where the case was that they didn't really care for the kid and that kind of stuff. So I understand all of that stuff. But right now, what I'm talking to is you guys in this room. And if you're in this room, most likely, you're, likely your mom and dad know the Lord, right? And that's what we're speaking about. And I'm not talking about the fact that moms and dads who know the Lord are perfect or anything like that. What I'm talking about is moms and dads who know the Lord care and they love you and they know you better than anybody else on the planet, better than anybody else. And they're the ones that know how you work. They know how you think. They know what fits you with you. They know what doesn't fit with you. You know what, you guys? Um, it's very, I, I do weddings and when I'm doing a wedding, one of the things that I ask the two people who come in to talk with me about getting married is what do your parents think? And there's a reason I ask that because almost um, to a person, when I have seen somebody that has had a marriage that's been a wreck and they have Christian parents, the Christian parents were not in favor of the marriage, almost to a person. And again, when I'm talking to somebody that's in a situation like that, I'm asking them what their parents think, and even, even non-Christian parents. I don't care if they're Christians or non-Christians. You know, if, if the parents love them and they know their kids, they know what they can deal with. And again, they're not always perfect, but there's somebody you need to be listening to because nobody knows you like they do. Nobody. And, you know, you want to be somebody who's wise, that's a place to get some instruction and the place to get some rules that you need to be paying attention to. Here's a passage in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. It says this, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And he puts that in there for a reason. Because many times when parents are outside of the Lord, they're telling you to do dumb things. But if your parents are in the Lord, you obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Earlier on, I was talking about the fact that in the book of Proverbs, it points you to two, two sets of people. One is to the Lord and the other one is to your parents and not to your pastor and not to your youth leader. And again, there, there's, uh, there's a reason that I said that. I have parents over, over the years that, you know, it's not all the time, but every once in a while, a parent will bring their kid into me to, to have me talk some sense into them. You know, I, I wish you would just talk with little Johnny. You know, you know he respects you and, and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I'm no good at that because I don't know the kid. I don't know who he is. I don't know where he comes from. I don't know how he thinks. And usually what I end up doing is having a talk with him and I get to a, to a point where I can actually talk to him and he's not just sitting there like a lump with his arms crossed and, and that kind of stuff. And I get to the point where I can talk to him and I, I go, okay, what's the deal with you and your mom? What's the deal with you and your dad? And so we start dealing with those issues and I start telling, actually all I ever do is point them right back to their mom and their dad. And then I talk to them about the fact that they need a relationship with the Lord. Do you know Jesus or not? And those are the two places that I send them because I'm not the guy with all the answers. And their parents know much more about what to do with their kid than I ever will because I don't know them, right? And so you need to figure out, guys that are in the position of being a kid, which actually every single one of us are, you need to figure out what your attitude is supposed to be towards your parents. And you need to be, again, you need to be paying attention to that. You, um, you uh, become per some person who just dismisses everything that your parents say. The Bible says that you're a fool. And I say it too, you're a fool. And like I said, there are only a few people on this planet who are ever gonna love you forever. Only a few. And mom and dad are at the top of the list. Like I said before, keep it in mind. You don't replace your mom and your dad with uh, Joey down the street. You don't replace it. You know, some, you know it, it's just, it, it was just ridiculous. And again, I'm, I'm speaking of all this stuff after the fact, and I know that, you guys, but there are people that I paid attention to that I can't even remember their names. And five years after the fact, I wasn't even talking to them anymore. And that's where a lot of kids go to get their wisdom. Dumb, dumb, dumb. And it says, uh, again, 
Hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. And so you again have that. Um, here's not one. The bad boys are morons. These are people that you don't need to be listening to. My son, verse 10, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the, for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. Now, I know that most of you are not dealing with people who want to actually go out and rob people and kill them. But maybe some of you are. If I was in East Pasco, this might be an appropriate um, Bible study. Certainly, um, I've hung out with guys uh, down in Riverside where this was an appropriate Bible study. Actually, I did a funeral for a good friend of mine um, who was killed because his buddies took him out and um, got him high on uh, heroin. It was called black tar back then. Got him high on heroin as soon as he got out of jail and killed him, left him in the parking lot at a hospital in the back of his um, El Camino, had a camper on it. They found him three days later because of the stink from him. And so I hung out with guys like, and those guys were all gang members and, and that kind of stuff and it absolutely applies to, to them. But some of you are, are dealing with people who are around you who like to just do stuff to people just to be rotten. Do stuff to people just to be mean, just to make them look better than the other person, that kind of stuff. That's the kind of people that you're talking about. It says, we shall find all kinds of precious possessions, 13. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us, let us all have one purse. They can't be really manly men because they have a purse, but. <laughs> My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. And this is why I called them morons. Um, verse 17, surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood they lurk secretly for their own lives. This is what that's talking about. If you're, if you're trying to catch a bird, and this was easier out in the amphitheater because there were, there were trees there. There's a tree right here and there's a bird in it and I want to catch the bird. And so what I do is I decide to make a snare. And in the, with a snare, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up like four poles and I'm going to put a net on top of it. And then I'm going to spread bird seed around it and I'm going to have some contraption that drops the net on top of the bird. The bird, meanwhile, is sitting in that tree watching me. Is that bird going under that net? No, absolutely. It just saw me do all this stuff. That bird's going to flit off somewhere and just go find food someplace else. It's not going to care about it. And what God says about these guys is they're like a bird that watches the trap set up and then goes down and eats it and gets snared in the thing. They're morons. A bird who did that would be a moron bird. It would be Birdus Moronis. You know, <laughs> whatever. And that's what this guy, that's what the Lord says about guys who have this kind of attitude. I grew up with some, some guys like this too. And I've, I've mentioned one guy before, um, Roy Mung. Um, was a friend of mine. His brother Marvin was in my same class. He was, an, he was a, Roy was an upperclassman. And Roy and Marvin um, were guys that were pretty, they were, they were pretty gnarly. They were, they were pretty, um, pretty rowdy guys. They were bad boys. And they would do dumb stuff. And this one time, I remember both of them standing there talking to me about how they got drunk with their dad. What a charmer he is. I'm like, I'm like 17 at the time. And so that's, uh, actually, no, I was 16 at the time because Roy was still in school. And, uh, and so Roy's 17, his brother Marvin is 16, dad's out getting drunk with them. And so what they decided to do was have a contest, punching a brick wall. So they're all drunk, punching a brick wall, and they come back and come up, come up to me, and they're bragging about this. And Roy holds up in his up his fist, and he goes, "See this right here, man?" And he shows me the scars and stuff like that. And then he shows me the, you know, tells me that he'd broken his fist punching this wall. Now I wasn't in a situation where I was going to go, "Hey, Roy, you're a really real idiot. Why don't you get away from me?" Because he was bigger than me. But I, was, I sat there looking at him and I'm like, oh, yeah, uh, 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 tried to get out of the conversation and move on. And all I could think of is, what a moron. You're punching a brick wall and then you're coming to me and bragging about it. You're, you're a fool, you know. I pity the fool. <laughs> In any case, um, what ended up happening was uh, Roy grew up. Roy moved back to Pennsylvania and Roy was a guy who gotten, you know, obviously he's a rowdy guy. And most of the times he got in fights with guys, guys um, played fair. 
And the last fight that Roy ever got in was uh, in a bar in Pennsylvania and uh, got in an argument with a guy and uh, apparently got in a fight. They found him down the road, uh, a few miles down the road in a ditch. The guy had followed him and shot him and killed him. And one of the things that guys like this don't get is that there's always gonna be somebody bigger than you at some point or another, and they're going to hurt you. That's what's gonna happen. You hang out with people like this, and you will get the results of hanging out with people like this. And it's why, why the Bible says that you don't. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians that says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? Here's another one, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character, always. Corrupts good character, always. Not most of the time, it's always. And again, if you want to be wise, you need to, you need to step away from that. You know what? Stop making lifestyle choices from mu movies or music videos. You know, a lot, of, a lot of times we're not even necessarily hanging out with people that are rotten in that kind of sense. But what you listen to on, on your um, phone, what you, what you watch when you go to the movies, those things impact you. And I really didn't, I didn't believe that they impacted me. And I don't know why I didn't get this, but um, you know, you, you, look at, you look at what people are listening to nowadays and there's all this filth that's, that's going on. You listen to rap music, if it's not Christian rap, you're in sin. The stuff that they say is sin. And rejoicing in it is sin. Read Romans chapter one, go check it out. And so, you know, it, it, it's like people look at, at what's happening today with people who listen to, the, listen to this stuff and they have this attitude towards them. But even when I was a kid, I saw this. I hate, hate with all of my heart country music. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> if I'm offending you, but there's a reason for it. You know what? I... Um, uh, I grew up with country music back in the 60s. My parents listened to it all the time. And so I know all the songs. I can, I can sing them to you right now. You can start a song and I can finish it, country music. And, you know, Waylon Jennings and Patty Wynette and you know, all these guys. And one, one, of the, one of the things that I noticed about my parents is that they did everything that was in the songs. And so all those songs were about cheating on your husband, cheating, cheating on your wife. All those songs were about drinking. All those songs about, were about, they called it honky-tonking. Yeah. We'll go honky-tonking. You know, yeah. and, and it's just going out and partying and that kind of stuff. And the, the fact that they lose their jobs and they lose their family and they lose this and they lose that. My dog died, my pickup truck's pretty, you know, wrecked and you know, all, all that kind of stuff. That was my parents' life. And I would sit there and watch them and go, you're actually doing what the song says. And I remember being in junior high, looking at this, just going, what's wrong with you guys? And then I discovered rock and roll, <laughs> right? And so I found, my, I found myself, you know, I was one of those guys that, that said, you know, it doesn't really bother me. I don't even listen to the words. I just like the music. I like the beat, man. I like the beat. You know, that kind of stuff until God started dealing with me on the issue. And one of the things that he dealt with me on is, a, is the fact that um, there's a passage in Proverbs that says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's in Proverbs 23, 7. And I, I realized that something needed to happen there. Another thing happened at the same time was all my, um, all my music got ripped off. And so I had a whole pile of eight track tapes in my 68 charger and somebody ripped off, ripped off my, my uh, carburetor at the same time that they ripped off my eight track tape player and all my, eight track, all my heathen eight track tapes. And so at that point, I had a choice to make. At that point, I'm following Jesus, and I'm like, okay, what kind of music am I, am I gonna get? And, and we didn't have the, you know, the, uh, what is it? What is it, Nate? Where do you get your music from? I iTunes and all that stuff, we didn't have that. So you had to go down to the store, and so I'm deciding what kind of music I'm gonna get. And so I just made a decision. I had some Christian artists that I liked, and so I decided I'm gonna start listening to that. And so I start listening to it, and it was amazing how... 
I started hearing what actually the words were in the music that I used to listen to because I worked in construction. So I'm in construction, we're on a job, and I didn't always have control of the radio. And so some song's playing, and it's telling me to go out and have sex with, you know, whoever and do this and do that. And I'm sitting there listening to it, I'm like, I can't believe that song says that. And I didn't, I didn't understand it before that point. And it wasn't until I got pulled out of it that I realized the stuff that was going on. And then I realized that this, this has been part of my problem. I've been doing exactly what the songs say. I sit there and mock my parents because they do exactly what the country songs say. And I'm doing exactly what the rock songs say. And so, again, you know, you got people who are, who are into that. They're doing the things that the songs say or that the movies say or whatever. And you know what? You did the same and I did the same too. And at some point, you got to figure out where you're going to get your stuff from. Garbage in, garbage out. Your, your head is a computer. You put garbage into it, guess what's coming out of it? And that's just the way that it goes. And so, again, we, we need to be um, paying attention to that. Chapter 2. Over in chapter 2, it says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guides the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. And so it starts off again with my son, receive my words. And so again, you have this, this pattern in the book of Proverbs where you have a godly parent who is pointing their child to real wisdom because, again, they care about them. That's what a parent is supposed to do. Um, the wisdom that this parent is, ta- is, is speaking about, again, it has to do with the Lord. Look at verse 5. It says, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, for the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. You know, there are people who want to leave their kids to themselves, And the Bible in Proverbs, again, says that a child left to himself brings shame to his parents, shame to his mother, specifically. And um, God hasn't placed this kernel of wonderfulness in every single one of us. What the Bible says has been placed in every single one of us is selfishness and original sin. The reason that I do the junk that I do is because I'm a sinner and I want to. And I don't consider you When I'm doing my junk, I just consider me. And what I am, when I start out, is a little barbarian. And I need to be trained not to be like that. And so obviously with all our kids, we start out with little kids who are completely selfish. I know that they're cute and they're sweet and stuff like that. And it looks cute and sweet when they're like six months old and that kind of stuff. When they start getting to a year old and they're still throwing fits and you know screaming and yelling, I want this and I want that, and it's all mine, 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 gimme, 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 and you know all of that kind of stuff, it starts getting old. By the time that they're three, it's really old. By the time that they're six, it's ridiculous. By the time that they're a teenager, somebody will kill them. <laughs> somebody's going to get them. And so, you know, it's like, obviously we don't want to leave our kids that way. And so we need to be pointing them in a certain direction. And again, what Solomon does is he points them to the knowledge of God. Godly parents point their kids to real wisdom and real wisdom comes to the knowledge of God. Verse uh, seven and eight, it says, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. You know, um, God's wisdom is a wisdom that shields and guards and preserves. The purpose of God's commands in scripture is not to wreck your life. It's to shield it. And it's one of those things that, again, you know, I've been on both sides of the issue. I grew up in a non-Christian home. And so when the, when the Bible would say certain things, I would be like, well, that's outdated and that's ridiculous and that's this and that's that. And why do I have to do that? And that can't apply to me and blah, 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 blah. And then I go out and do it and I reap the same consequences that lo and behold, 3,000 years ago, they were reaping the same consequences I am in the 20th century. It was last century. In the 20th century. 
Whoa, how did that happen? It's because nobody's ever changed. That's how it happens. Everybody's exactly the same. And so the same stuff you see in Proverbs is the same stuff you see at school, is the same stuff you see at work, is the same stuff you see at church, is the same stuff you see in your family. And we all act the same. And God knows it and he's always known it. And he's got an answer for it. And it might be, a, you know, it might be wisdom for you to pay attention to it. And so the purpose, of, again, of God's commands is not to wreck your life. It's to shield it. It's to bless you. And when God says no, he's not a no guy. He's a yes guy. He says, he says yes as much as possible. When he says no, it's literally to keep you from destroying yourself. And so you got to keep that in mind. Same thing with, it, you know, hopefully with your dad, with your mom. Same, same kind of situation there. Um, verse uh, um, 10 and 11, when wisdom enters your heart, when, enter, when um, oh, I'm getting behind on the, on the thing. Um, when wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you. You know, wisdom is not something that you get just for the sake of wisdom. Wisdom is something that you get so that you can have a life that's, that's good, have a life that's better. And you're not going to have the, the effects of wisdom until you actually want it, until it's pleasant to your soul. And that's the, that's the next thing that you, that you have there. Wisdom does its work when your attitude is right. It has to be pleasant to your soul. Here's how it usually goes, though. Um, I'm, I'm a pastor. I've been doing this for, you know, since 82, okay? And so it's been a long time, over 30 years now that I've been a pastor. I have people who walk into my office all the time who come out of Christian homes. And what they've done is they've been in a Christian home. Mom and dad have been praying for them, you know, told them what needs to happen and that kind of stuff. They grow up. They decide that mom and dad don't know what they're talking about. And they pick Johnny or Judy down the street. And they decide to do what Johnny or Judy says. And then they get into that whole thing and their pride keeps them there for a period of time. And then after a period of time, they are so wrecked and so messed up that they don't have anywhere to turn. And if they didn't know that there had been a God, they probably would have killed themselves. I've heard this over and over. And then they give their life back to Jesus. And then at some point they're talking to me and they're like, Steve, I've wasted my life. You know, I, I, I walked with Jesus when I was 14 years old and now here I am, I'm 35 and I've wasted literally 20 years of my life. I've wasted my life. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on my second, my third marriage and I just now know Jesus. And it's like, what am I gonna do? And they're bummed out and they're torn up and they're ripped up and they are thirsty for any kind of wisdom that they can get. It's become pleasant to their soul. But they had to go through 20 years of stupid to get there. Here's a, here's, here's a different thing that you could do. You could start off with not being dumb <laughs> and just go through and skip the 20 years of stupid and just do what Jesus wants you to. And your life will be awesome. You know, um, one of the, again, one of the things that, that happens here is um, when I was uh, first a Christian and, and teaching and stuff, I didn't have any teenagers that grew up in Calvary Chapel. Everybody who, um, who was a teenager that came to Calvary Chapel came and got saved at Calvary Chapel. That's the way that it works. But some of you have grown up in Christian homes and you are on, you are on one of two tracks, you guys. You either despise the word of God and you don't want it to have anything to do with you or you're somebody who's listening up and you would like your, your life to be different from the people who are around you. It's one of those two things. And it's very rarely any, anything that's in the middle of that. And you have to make some decisions here. Um, there, you know, a, a lot of times when I'm, when I'm talking to kids who've grown up in, in church and stuff, it's hard for them. And I understand that because you hear it all the time. But this is stuff that's, that's changed your parents' life. And there's a reason that they've stuck to it all of their lives. There's a reason for it. And it's because Jesus is good. You're used to Jesus. You're used to hearing about Jesus. And you, frankly, probably don't love him as much as your mom and dad do. And that's a problem because you don't know him very well if you're in that position. But not, not everybody who grows up in a Christian home is like that. There are people that I know who grew up in Christian homes that are just awesome. You know, when I, when I look at um, like the guys on staff, you know, Mitch grew up just like me, heathen kid, doing all this junk, life is messed up, that kind of stuff. We find Jesus, everything turns around. You have the same thing with Kyle. Kyle grew up like that too. Then you have guys like Matt. And Matt grew up in a Christian home and he did it right the whole time. 
He doesn't have any of the baggage that I've got, you guys. He doesn't have any of the baggage that Mitch has, Mitch has got. He doesn't have any of the baggage that Kyle's got. And you have Zach Lamberson, same kind of thing. No baggage. I'm not saying that they're perfect guys and that they're without sin and that kind of stuff, but they don't have the 20 years of stupid. They don't have the three or four years of stupid or the 10 years of stupid. They don't have any of that stuff. And then you get, then you got guy um, like Lindsay Kessie, godly woman, grew up in a Christian home. And so it works both ways. And some of the people that I respect the most grew up in Christian homes. But the norm is you grow up in a Christian home, you despise the things of God, you go out and do what the world does, you get tweaked, you get schooled. And then at some point you turn it around and you're sorry for the rest of your life. You know, there are things that you can do that will make you sorry for the rest of your life. Um, here's one. Look at verses 12 through 22. To deliver you. Discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you, verse 11, to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perversity of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and who, who are devious in their paths. See that right there, verse 15? Their ways are crooked, they're devious in their paths. That's not the idea of they're just bent people going the wrong direction. That's the idea of they're people who are changeable. And when they're trying to get you involved with them, they, they have crooked paths. They try to get you involved in those crooked paths. If you won't go with them, they'll change tack so that they can get you. And, you know, I, I grew up uh, going to multiple schools. I went to 12 different schools by the time that I was a senior. And so I was always getting new friends. And there were guys that I knew that were just like that. They'd come up to me and tell me, you know, try to get me involved in something stupid. And I go, yeah, I don't think so. That's not happening. That's pretty dumb. And they go, oh yeah, man, you're right. That's pretty dumb. And then they just lay off for a while. And then they come back and they take another angle at it and try to get me in exactly the same spot. It's weird about people. They don't like doing their sin by themselves. They want somebody to do it with them. And you know, that's a the situation there to deliver you from the immoral woman. And again, it's a, it's a guy talking to his son. From the seductress who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth, forgets the covenant of her God, for her house leads down to death and her paths to the dead. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep the paths of righteousness. For the upright will dwell in the land and the blameless will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the earth and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. Here's wisdom at work. Um, one of the things that it does is it shields you from sexual immorality. Um, in, in the book of Proverbs, in the first nine chapters, Solomon talking to his son, he talks about sexual immorality in detail five times in nine chapters. Why do you think he does that? Because when you're young, that's one of the, well, that, that's one of the biggest temptations that you're ever going to go through. It's one of the thing, the biggest things, the, the hardest things um, to end up saying no to. And the reason is because it's pleasurable. You know, I, re I remember when I was a young Christian, there were people who would tell me that sin was not fun. So I, I can tell you right now, sin is absolutely fun. I had all kinds of fun doing everything that I did. It wasn't until after I did it that the fun stopped. There's always a price to pay. And, you know, the, the Bible talks about the fact that there is sin for a season. The, the verse up there is out of um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. It says, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. You know, it's fun for a season and then comes payday. And there's always a payday. You know, when I, when I was younger, um, one of the things that I always wanted to do, uh, I don't even want to say this because my son's in here, um, but one of the things that I always wanted to do was go skydiving. And I never got to do it, but I always wanted to. And I thought it would, you know, it would just be the coolest thing because it's like you're flying. You jump out of a plane and you're flying. That would be so cool. And in fact, I was talking with a buddy of mine one time and I was like, that's the way that I'd like to die. You know, just, you're just flying through the air and you're having a, you know, a grand old time of it. It's better than a roller coaster ride. I love roller coaster rides. And it's, it's better than any of that, you know, and then at the end, it's just like, 
and you're all done. <laughs> and it's over, you know? And so I kind of think that's the way to go. If I ever get cancer or something, you know, if you hear, me, hear about me going skydiving, you know what's happening. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I wouldn't do that. I trust God, even with my death. But sin comes with a price, and it's a hefty price. You know, again, it'd be really pleasurable to jump out of a plane, but sooner or later, you're going to hit the ground. And so there's fun for a time, but inevitably, there's a payday. And the Bible says that um, the repercussions that kick in are death. The Bible warns that the wages of sin is death. So for a moment of pleasure, five minutes of pleasure, 10 minutes of pleasure, you can have a lifetime of regret and you end up just destroying your life. You can have a reputation that you've built up over 20 years and in five minutes you can destroy it just because of this sin right here. And again, you know, you need to have some wisdom. You know, there, there is this period of time after I gave my life to Jesus that I wish I could go back and redo because I wasn't walking strong with the Lord. It was like three or four years. I wasn't walking strong with the Lord and most of the mistakes that I'm still paying for are mistakes I made in that period of time. And if I could go back, I'd fix it. You know, you, know, you hear those songs, Dear Younger Me, you know, you know that song? You go back, if you go back and talk to yourself, you know, and, and the guy in the song is, you know, wondering if he, if he would, you know, tell him to change things. If I went back and talked to myself, I'd punch myself in the nose. <laughs> what is wrong with you? I grab myself by the neck and I go, stop, be it now, you know, that kind of thing. And you just don't want to be in that position. Chapter three, and we'll wrap it up. It says, my son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord. Okay, so again, we have this pattern. And the father is saying to his son, don't forget what I'm saying to you. Don't forget my law. And again, it's because the dad loves his kid. He's telling him the truth. And then the second thing that you see him pointing to is trusting in the Lord. Now, go back to verse three. He says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. See that word mercy? Mercy and truth. That word, that word mercy is a word that means, also means loving kindness. It's the ability to forgive, to not always get what you think that you deserve. That's what that word mercy is. It's the, it's the idea of giving people around you a break. If you are somebody who every time somebody says something wrong to you, you're completely offended and you can't stand them anymore and you don't really want to hang out with them, you have no mercy. If you're a person who when somebody does something wrong to you, they come up to you and they say, you know what, I'm really sorry and I just want to make it right. And you go, well, I just don't know if I can forgive you. You have no mercy. That is not merciful. Mercy is the idea of you don't give people what they deserve. You don't give it to them. When I'm asking for mercy, all I'm asking is, don't give me what I know I deserve. That's what mercy is. And if you're not a merciful person, it's gonna go hard for you because the Bible says that if you're not merciful, God won't be merciful to you. That's really clear on that whole issue. God wants people who will give people a break. The Bible says a mul uh, 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 love covers a multitude of sins. And it's the idea of I, can, I, I see people around me and I know that they're jerks and I know people do things wrong and I give them a break on it. So can people have a bad day and say something stupid to you and you're not gonna come down on them? Is that possible? That's mercy. Can people have had a bad pizza and they don't feel good and they do something dumb around you, right? And you, and you give them a break on it, that's mercy. Can people come up to you and have actually done something to you and done something wrong and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And you forgive them. That's mercy. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Then it says truth. Um, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. The word truth there, is the, it, means the, it means true. It's the idea of being, it's the idea of truth itself, but it's the idea of being somebody who's true. True to principle, true to your friends. It's got the idea of faithfulness in it. And so if, if you, if you um, there was an old phrase, that guy's true blue. And it was the idea that you could trust him. It was the idea that he'd have your back. It was the idea that he cared about you. It was the idea that he was what he was, that kind of stuff. So two things Solomon says there, you keep mercy 
you be merciful to people, and you be somebody who's true. And that's, again, what we're, what we're supposed to be. And then again, he points them to God. And in verses 5 through 8, the, the whole idea there is acknowledging that God is smarter than you. Look at verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. That means you don't think you're the smartest unit on the planet. That means you understand that God may know something that you don't know. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths. You want God to direct you? There's a, there's a if, if then statement there. If I, will, if I will trust in him, if I will stop leaning on myself, and if I will acknowledge him, then he's going to direct me. Look at the next section. Um, uh, verse uh, 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. And so again, that whole idea of God is smarter than me, the 9 through 12, it says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will over, overflow with new wine. That's the idea of recognizing God as your Lord, recognizing him as your Lord, that he's somebody that you serve and he's somebody that you owe. That's why you give to the Lord, because he's somebody that you serve and he's somebody that you owe. It's not just saying stuff about how you love Jesus. It's not just saying stuff about how he's in charge of your life. It's the idea of you show through your actions. God, I'm yours. Everything I have is yours. I'm all yours. And one of the ways that you know, they, they did that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament was by giving to the Lord. And so that's the lordship of God. Look at verse 11 and 12. It's the fatherhood of God. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. And that's the other thing that we need to understand. I need to acknowledge God as my Lord and I need to acknowledge him as my father. I need to understand that God actually loves me and he's out for my best. I can tell you right now that, that both my kids, there's not, that, not anything that I have ever done. And again, I'm a, I'm a Christian man. I've been following Jesus for a long time. And so I understand that people make mistakes, but this is a mistake that I didn't make on purpose because it was made towards me all the time. I never, I never did anything out of selfishness with my kids in the sense of, you know, I just want them to do what I want them to do just because I want them to do it. I always had in mind the things that were good for my kids and things that would bless them. And that's why I did it. That's what a father does. That's what he does. That's what your father does. I'm talking about God. That's what he's doing with you. I didn't do it perfectly. I know, even though I don't know anything about myself in that instance, I know I didn't do it perfectly. But I know that that was my heart. You can know for sure that God's heart towards you is miles above mine towards my son or towards my daughter. And you need to recognize that about God in your life. There are reasons that he allows you to go through things and sometimes he's correcting you and the correction is a good thing. It's a good thing for you. Again, because he loves you. And so there's other, there's other things that we could talk about in, in the passage, but we'll just end it right there. That's pretty good, don't you think? Yeah, that's a good place to go for wisdom. You know, um, going through and, and talking about this stuff, though, you may be in situations where um, maybe this is your first time here and you don't even know the Lord. You know, it's like, it's like you know about God, you know about Jesus, and, and you're in the right place to, to hear about all that stuff. But you never made a real commitment to follow him. And as a matter of fact, you may be one of those people that's been doing exactly the opposite of what God says in those passages, and now you're reaping the consequences from it, and you'd like to have something different. I could tell you for sure you can get something different from Jesus. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there about um, having the right head and having the right heart about things, but God doesn't leave you on your own in those things. What, he, what the Bible says is that the God of the universe comes and lives inside of you and he begins changing you from the inside out. And so this is one of my favorite things to let people know. You know what? I drink all the beer I want to. I drink all the whiskey I want to. I beat up all the people I want to. I sleep around as much as I want to. What else? I cheat as much as I want to. I steal as much as I want to. I just don't want to anymore. And that's what God does with you. He comes inside and he begins changing your desires. You may be sitting there going, I don't know if I can live that. You know, uh, let, me, let me just disaffect you of something. I know you can't live that. 
but Jesus can when he's living inside of you. The other thing is you may be sitting here and I just did this whole thing with, you know, Christians going on, you know, going astray and, and walking away from the Lord and, you know, having a attitude of despising the word and, and that kind of stuff. That can change right now, you guys, right now. And all you have to do is recommit your life to Jesus. You know, there was some, if you grew up in a Christian family and you're here, there was probably some point when you were a little kid and you said, I want Jesus to, you know, I want to follow Jesus. I want to go to heaven, mommy. And your mom or your dad led you to the Lord when you were a kid. Well, when you grow up, there's, there's a point where you have to make it your own. And usually um, in Jewish households, it was right, about, right around the time you were 13. You, you made it your own at that point. And if you've been walking away from the Lord, you need to make him your own. You know, the wisdom has to become pleasant to you. And that only changes with a, with a change of heart. And that comes from having a real knowledge of God. Uh, when it talks about the fear of the Lord, it's the idea of, I don't want to do anything that displeases him because I care about him. And that's where you need to be. And if you're not there, God can change your heart on that too. But you need to commit your life to following Jesus. So, you know where this is going now. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do exactly that. And so if you're here this morning and you know that you need to make things right with the Lord, you need to get things straight, you need to be committed to following him and you want the life that he's got, you wanna be wise. If, the, if, you, if that's what you want, then you need to give your life to Jesus. The Bible says that if you'll receive Christ, that he'll come inside and he'll begin, begin changing you from the inside out, like I told you. And that's what happened with me. That's what happened with almost everybody I know. And you're no different than anybody in this room. God could change you too. It's just a matter of if, if you want to. So I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand uh, when I pray. And I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to ask you to pray with me standing up. I'm going to ask you to stand up and pray with me a prayer asking Christ to take control of your life. Okay, so think about that while we pray. Jesus, again, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, that you have a way that we should go and that you make it really clear. I, like, I really like Proverbs because it's like, I don't know, two by four upside the head, <laughs> making it clear. Um, it's pretty cool, Lord. God, I, I just want to pray for all of us, Lord, that we would be people who would walk in wisdom, that we'd have um, our, our eyes set on you and on the things that you have for us, Lord, instead of what Judy down the street thinks. Um, Lord, I, I want to pray for those who are here this morning that may not know you, that have never committed their lives to you. Or maybe they have and they've been walking away and they, they want to get it straight. God, I just pray that you would give them boldness to stand for you and to finally say yes. So while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you're here this morning, you need Jesus, you know it, you want him, you raise your hand. Raise it up high so I can see it back in the back. God bless you. Anybody else? You don't know if you're a Christian. You don't know if you're going to heaven. You know that you're not doing this and you would like something different than that. You'd like to know that you know the Lord. You'd like to be forgiven for your sin. You'd like to have the wisdom that comes from God implanted, the Bible says, in your soul. That's literally the words that it use, uses. If you'd like that, you'd like to follow Christ, raise your hand up. Anybody else? You've been walking away. I see your hand, God bless you. You've been walking away and you know that you need to get things straight. You need to get it right. And if that's you, why don't you raise your hand up? I'm going to pray for you too. In the front, on the side. God bless you. Anybody else? This is your moment. You can walk out changed. Or you can keep what you have. What do you want? Raise your hand if you want Jesus. Okay. All right, let me pray for you guys. Thank you, Jesus, for these that have raised their hands. And Lord, pray that you give them, again, boldness to stand for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys that raise your hands, why don't you look up at me? I'm gonna, you're already standing up. You can stand up, man. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have you stand up and I'm gonna have you pray this prayer with me, asking Christ to come into your life. But you need to be, mean it from your heart. So all you guys that raise your hand, go ahead and stand up. Over here, over here, you guys too. Back over here. And just, um, I'm, I'm going to lead you in a, in a word of prayer, um, but you seriously need, this is between you and the Lord. And so you need to, be, need to mean it between you and the Lord, okay? 
And so just pray this out loud after me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I know that I'm a sinner and that I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please write my name in your book of life and make me a Christian. I thank you that you love me, that you died for me, that you rose again from the dead, and that you're coming back for me. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the power to live for you. I give my whole life to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.